Davidson. Well, good evening, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here with Ambassador McNaughton. He and I share something in common, and that is uh, a long time ago, longer for you than for me, David. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, no, no, no comment on aging. But we both work for Don Jameson, and Don Jameson was a very uh, wonderful member of Parliament for Newfoundland, who at the time of his uh, retirement uh, was Canada's Foreign Affairs Minister, uh, and spent a number of years in London as the High Commissioner as well. So David, my first question to you, and by the way, Don would note that I become a banker and I'm wearing blue, which he never approved of as a liberal, but somehow you managed as a nonpartisan official of the government of Canada to wear red and uh, point to the Canadian flag as the reason for it. So I just, I, I just want to say you've learned a great deal from Don, obviously. But did you ever imagine working with Don Jameson, uh, I think a diplomat extraordinaire, that you would have the kind of easy passage that you've enjoyed over the last two years as Canada's <laughs> ambassador in Washington? Well, actually, no, I, I never really did um, think I'd be doing this. And certainly when I presented my credentials to President Obama, I had no idea what the next couple of years would be like. Uh, having said that, I, I uh, you know, it's, it's an honor and a privilege to represent your country in any capacity and to be doing it uh, at this time in Washington is really a very special privilege for me and I, 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 I occasionally pinch myself and, you know, just to realize uh, that that's what I'm doing. And, you know, the other day uh, I was sitting with my wife and I said to Leslie, you know, in your wildest dreams, did you ever think that I'd be Canada's ambassador to the United States? And she said, sorry, dear, but you were never in my wildest dreams. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. Well, uh, you certainly retained that Newfoundland sense of humor that rubbed off on you <laughs> years ago. Um, so look, you've signed, you, you were there for the signing of the of the Canada-US-Mexico agreement. Uh, I listened to you over our brief moment together at the table. On Friday, and by Saturday, which is not entirely unexpected, President Trump is talking about giving notice to the end, six-month notice period for the end of, of NAFTA. Now, some have said that that's really an American matter, that's not for us, that's their issue. Uh, I question, is it just their issue? It's, it's, it is a notice that affects us, and frankly, I question whether or not he has the legal right as president expressly alone to make that decision. Can you, can you help us understand that issue? Well, I think there's, there's sort of two parts to that question. One of them is, uh, does he have the legal right? And I think that'll be the subject of some debate in the United States. Um, you know, technically, I think he can terminate the agreement. Um, even that is under some uh, discussion, and I'm sure there'll be lawsuits associated with it. Um, it is, after all, the United States. Um, but, but the other part of it is that there is legislation that implemented the agreement and to change that legislation would require an act of Congress. So, so I think you know there'll be there'll be lots of debate about that, and I don't think that's something that we need to engage in at all. I mean that is their process, and they can sort that out. Having said that, I I have no intention of uh, sitting back and and stopping what we have been doing for the last several years, and that is uh, making sure that Americans understand. Um, the importance to, to their economy of trading with Canada, of selling to Canada. I mean, I, one, of, one of my favorite um, lines that I use to Americans, which always surprises them, is that they sell more to Canada than they do to China, Japan, and Great Britain combined. And they're always surprised at that. And I think, you know, we've done a reasonable job, um, you know, not just the embassy and not just the federal government, but Team Canada, the provinces, the private sector, the unions, 
of really raising the profile of Canada in the United States in terms of its importance to, to their success. And then I think also we've been talking about, you know, our cooperation with them in military matters and security and a whole range of things. So, so we're going to continue to do that. Um, and I think, uh, um, you know, at the end of the day, um, the kind of uncertainty that has been in existence for the last year and a half or two years, uh, the sooner we put that to bed, the better it'll be for Americans and Canadians alike. And, and I think we will make that point. So let me just speak to you as somebody who wears the hat of the chair of three public company boards in Canada, as well as being a vice chair at the Bank would of Montreal. James have ever thought that would happen? No, he never thought it at all. He <laughs> thought I was going to be shoveling snow in, in Bonavista Bay for the rest of my days. <laughs> but as somebody who, who sits in, in those chairs, uh, sits with a board, usually half the board are, are American citizens. In the case of two of the companies, more than 80% of our business is in the United States. And so the certainty around getting to an agreement is absolutely critical. And I don't think it's, it's telling secrets that I shouldn't tell to say that many Canadian companies that are massively engaged in the US were looking very carefully at where they ought to be in the absence of no deal. So it speaks to the size of your accomplishment and that of the government in getting a, a deal. So my question then is, if the president declares he's going to terminate NAFTA, and you say it's a legal question whether or not he can, uh, the fact of the matter is Congress becomes incredibly important in that discussion. You've said you're not going to sit on the sidelines. So can you give us some sense of how deeply engaged you and the team were with Congress and what you will do without walking on toes going forward to make sure the Canadian position is sure. known? Look, we, um, we worked with members of Congress uh, throughout the piece. And in fact, um, I'm convinced that um, there, they had an impact on helping to bring uh, the US to a position where we could actually make a deal. Uh, because if you recall, after the uh, Mexico and the US reached an agreement in the early summer, they were really sort of saying, you know, this is a fait accompli, uh, you either take this deal or we're just gonna go ahead without it, without you. And I think they got a fair bit of pushback, not just from the business community, but they got a fair bit of pushback from Congress, which was, uh, don't count on us agreeing to this if Canada is not part of it. Now, in fairness, I got a lot of calls from members of the House and of the Senate saying, we understand from the administration that you're being unreasonable, that you're not being flexible, and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, three weeks before we ended up doing the deal, I got a call from a senator who said, uh, there's a group of us would like to come over and have dinner with you at the embassy and talk to you about how can we can help get this done. And it was Democrats and Republicans. And we had 15 senators come over for dinner, which is you know, unheard of. Um, and they were both pushing to find out whether we were being unreasonable, and also you know, just saying, how do we help? And same thing on the House side. Uh, you know, I had a lot of people who I knew were influential with the administration who, uh, who I talked to all the time. And, and I always, you know, we would get comments from the Americans, not mentioning any names, uh, that said, you know, you're going around us, you're interfering in our system, how would you like it if we did the same for you? And I used to say to Minister Freeland, um, we better double down on this because it's clearly working. Um, yeah. so, uh, so, so I think, you know, there's a, there's a fine line. I mean, the reality is, is the United States system is that there are three equal branches of government. The administration is but one of them. And, and to think that we are going to go through something that is, is as important to Canada as this trading relationship is and not talk to the people who actually have to pass the laws that implement it is, 
you know, an interesting concept, but it's not one that I'm prepared well, to live with. Well, it's the same in Canada. Of course, you've got the House of Commons and you've got the Independent Senate Caucus, um, which is the second part of the body here. Any independent senators in the room? Uh, um, yeah, I, yeah, anyway, I will reserve comment on that. Let me, let me ask you then about, about the House, because the House has changed, obviously. About yeah. 39, 40 seats have flipped. What does that reality do to the equation? People have reflected on a more center, center, left Democratic caucus than had heretofore existed. What does that do to the possibility of having the House specifically prove the deal as negotiated? Well, again, um, you know, during the negotiations, uh, we had various people, and not mentioning any names, who were very critical about of our, our desire to include a labor chapter, an environment chapter, $16 an hour wage in the rules of origin, who said, you know, this is something that is going to uh, annoy the U.S. administration, all of these soft things are... Well, thank goodness they're there, because actually the issue that, that, that the Democrats have focused in on is not actually uh, about m m many of the substantive parts of the agreement. They focused in on the enforceability. And you know we fought hard to keep Chapter 19, which is an important part of the agreement, but there's also Chapter 20, which is the state-to-state -state yes. mechanism. And Effectively, Chapter 20 has not been you know, has not been an operational thing for the last six or seven years because the Americans haven't been appointing panelists. And now, because of the fact that the Democrats want to make sure that 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 these these measures that we've agreed to are enforceable, they have insisted, and, and Ambassador Lighthizer agreed to make Chapter 20 a viable operation, like a, a, a real dispute resolution mechanism, which, as I say, it hasn't been for some time. So, and, and I got to tell you, I mean, I, you know, I'd love to take credit for all of this. Bob Lighthizer was very helpful, very constructive, and I think he knew that there was a possibility that we'd be dealing with a different Congress. Certainly when we went past the end of April, we knew we were going to be dealing with a different Congress. And he had in his mind also, how are you going to get some of the Democrats on side? Uh, and, and I think it was partly his skill and his understanding of Washington that helped us get to where we are at the present moment. Ambassador, we all watched with a lot of interest in the days leading up to the signing ceremony uh, on Friday, um, the speculation about who would sign, whether or not the prime minister would be present or not present, et cetera. Can you enlighten us at all as to what was going on? Was this part of the state of play of negotiations on steel and on aluminum, and with respect to those two, those two products, when can we expect a resolution? Because you, I think, yourself several times said that it was your expectation that as a deal was done, so too would these matters be resolved, these tariffs. Well, you know, there were, there were, there were, there's two components to that. One of them was that right from the outset, the president, you know, linked the 232 tariffs with NAFTA. And, and we frankly took the position that the 232 tariffs were illegal and unnecessary, and we continue to take that position. Um, and as such, we did not want to link it totally to the NAFTA negotiations. Having said that, you know, we did press them uh, throughout saying, you know, if you want to have a celebration of this deal. It's going to be hard for us to celebrate um, when we've still got these illegal tariffs hanging over our heads, and we're not going to agree to quotas on aluminum, and we're not going to agree to a, a, a quota that prevents Hamilton from coming back or from Everest and Regina from shipping pipe. And there might have been somebody who undiplomatically suggested that the fourth secretary in Argentina show up with a bag over his head to sign the agreement. I don't know, don't know who that was, but, but, but no, I mean, you know, look, the reality is, is that 
we're proud of the agreement we got. The other factor is, is that, that notwithstanding the fact that the agreement needs to go through Congress and through our parliament and through the Mexico, Mexican situation, the side letter that we signed on autos mm -hmm. takes effect immediately. So the, the reality is, is that, that we are no longer subject to the threat of the use of 232 that would devastate our auto industry and our country, uh, which I think was a tremendous, I mean, if the only time that they can use 232 against- is that against, an agreed interpretation of what was signed as a yes, side letter? Yes, yes, I mean, it, we would have to increase our footprint in the auto industry in Canada by something like 70%. Yeah, the numbers are quite dramatic. <coughs> before, before we got there. So, so I think that's, you know, and, and as I say, that's in effect right now. So, so let's, let's go to some of the Slido uh, uh, questions that are coming in. Uh, obviously, the app is very popular. First one is, after two years with Trump, <coughs> do you see a change in strategy for Canada in the next two years? Um, I, I think it's, it's the same overall strategy. I think the tactics may be a little bit different. I think the strategy is to continue to um, impress on the Americans um, how important Canada is to their, their security and their prosperity. And so in that the, the trade, the, the foundations of the trade agreement are, are set, we've still got things like, you know, softwood lumber and the steel and aluminum and everything else, but it won't be as big a preoccupation as it's been over the last, you know, I hope we can turn to some of the other items where um, you know we have we can make common cause things like regulatory cooperation. We're having a meeting tomorrow in Washington on, of the RCC, which is you know if there's not health and there's not safety involved, the, the 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 these regulations that are this far apart between our two countries cost business a huge amount of money. And so I'm hoping we can make some more progress on that. We've got things like opioid addiction where, you know, we need to work together to try and find, it's, it killed last year in the United States, it killed more Americans than during the entire Vietnam War. Uh, and it's becoming a real, you know, curse in Canada also. And so, so, you know, and we've got Venezuela where we're working together and we've got North Korea and we've got the Arctic and, you know, there's just so many areas where where we have common interests. And we don't, you know, I don't want to spend all my time uh, focusing in on the areas where we disagree. There's lots of them. But I keep saying to people, you know, if we, if we started the day working on all the things we, we agree on, we wouldn't have a whole lot of time at the end of the day to work on the ones we don't. Let me, let me follow up with the, another question from the Slido uh, question app, which asks, what percentage odds do you see that the steel tariffs will remain in place 12 months from now? Um, you know, um, it's really easy to predict what's going to go on in the administration, so let me take it. Uh, look, I, I don't think they will exist. I am, I am, I am almost positive. Is it more than 90% that they won't be there 12 months from now? And the reason for that is because we have an integrated steel market. The, the, the measures that, that are on at the present moment are not just hurting Canadian companies, they're hurting US companies. And, the, and, the, and the, the retaliatory measures that we've taken are also hurting uh, Americans, which they were designed to do. And so I think that the pressure, it, it's not, they're not gonna do it because, um, they like us or they think we're good friends or anything like that, they're gonna do it because it's causing them problems in their own country. And I think that you're already seeing some of it. And I think the other thing, and you've seen it you know, from members of Congress and from people like the Chamber of Commerce and the manufacturers and, and the farm lobby, which is, well, you got your deal, what's the need for the tariffs, right? The only people that are continuing to uh, you know, agitate are there a couple of companies in the United States who are doing very well out of this? Um, but that's their corporate interest, not the national interest. The other thing is, is we've got, you know, um, 
steel workers, United Steel Workers, on both sides of the border. And I keep telling Leo, if he doesn't get these tariffs off, he's not welcome back in Sudbury, so. That's, that's a pretty serious threat. That is Ambassador. serious, yeah. that is serious. Ambassador, let me, let me switch subjects, and I just want to quote from uh, an article that was in all of the, or a number of papers across Canada by Minister Freeland when she talked about and summarized the deal. She made mention of Canada's energy sector. She said, the existing NAFTA contained a clause that infringed on Canadian sovereignty by preventing our country from controlling where we sell our energy resources. That clause is now gone, so therefore the sector will benefit from administrative improvements, uh, save us on fees, but allow us to be masters in our own house in terms of uh, energy export and sales. Can you, can you um, tell us how we should be thinking about Canada's capacity to be better, to be more competitive, to get better pricing on energy, given everything that's happening today. We've seen the news the last days in Alberta. Yeah, the I... Constraint on exports. You know, I've talked to uh, Premier Notley and to her officials over the last couple of weeks. Um, you know, I know um, there are differences of opinion within the industry as to whether or not that measure was appropriate. Um, you know, I think it's got to be looked at as I think she presented it and the government of Alberta presented it, is that it's a, it's a short-term measure. Uh, the reality is that the storage is full, the pipelines are full, um, rail cars are full. Um, we need to find ways to get uh, our oil to market. This is not an Alberta problem, this is a Canadian problem, and we need to uh, pull together to find ways to get it get done. And I've said to, uh, you know, one of the answers to that is to make sure that Line 3 gets approved, that Enbridge can ship their oil, that the Keystone XL, that we overcome the Montana problems. I mean, yes, we have challenges in this country in terms of getting pipelines approved, but we're not alone in that. We have, you know, whether it be the Dakota Access, whether it be Montana, whether it be Minnesota, whether it be New Hampshire in terms of preventing, you know, uh, Quebec Hydro from, you know, tra the transmission lines going through. Getting approval for infrastructure is critical. Um, and I think, you know, well, well, you know, it's important to have the freedom to sell your product wherever you can. In the short term, you know, we have to make sure that we can get our, our oil to uh, refineries in the Gulf Coast um, and, and elsewhere so that we don't have that differential that is, you know, robbing the country of a huge amount of money. And I think, uh, you know, that, that th there's no short-term solution. And I understand the frustration of Albertans, uh, but we as a country have to find a way to get this Do done. Do you expect any pushback? Have you had any pushback uh, in the United States government any of the uh, agencies of government to the to the program which was announced by the government of Alberta. Well, I you know I spoke to Ambassador Kraft last night, and we've we've communicated with um, officials at state and at Energy and other places. And the reality is is that none of the cutbacks um, are enough to trigger the clause in NAFTA in terms of the cutbacks. There's no attempt to discriminate against American companies and in favor of Canadian companies. And it is a temporary measure. And the reality is, which I've, you know, communicated to the Americans, is that, you know, one of the ways in which they can help us do that is to speed up the response through the Department of State to the, the, uh, the Montana, um, you know, court decision, because it's back in state's uh, lap right now. Because the president has said he wants Keystone XL, and and you know, we start getting that that built in the spring. It doesn't mean we've got a an outlet tomorrow, but at least you know you've got some hope. So back to Slido, uh, a, a question that's on everybody's mind: What is your preferred pronunciation for this trade deal? <laughs> NAFTA 2.0. Uh, but the president I'm says, not one of the president villages. says NAFTA is an unmentionable word. I know. Ambassador, you're a brave man. Yeah. Um, let I, me let me come to another uh, another issue. Um, 
And that is the minister, Minister Freeland made mention as well in her, her first comment on the deal, when she summarized the deal, on the importance of uh, the changes uh, to wages and, and uh, labor rights for Mexican workers, pointing out that's good for those workers, but more importantly, good for Canadian workers, because it, it, it establishes a more level playing field. Can you tell us how much you expect the field to be leveled and over what period of time? Well, you know, that, that negotiation over uh, the rules of origin in the auto sector was a really important part of the negotiations. And, um, you know, this is where you have to give an awful lot of credit to our public service in terms of their knowledge, uh, detailed knowledge of, of uh, how these things work. There's a, a fellow who works, uh, you know, in the trade part of global affairs, Martin Thornell, who knows the rules of origin inside out. Um, and we were struggling because we had the Americans saying, we need 50% domestic content. And if that had happened, the combination of 50% US content and Mexico's low wages, our industry would have been done. And so at the end of January in Montreal, we presented this proposal, which was to use you know, a certain percentage of uh, autos needed to come from plants that had you know, workers that made $16 an hour. And, and the Americans um, were extraordinarily critical. Uh, there were temper tantrums, there were all sorts of things said and everything else. And then we met at um, USTR a couple of weeks later and I remember Ambassador Lighthizer saying, apparently the much maligned Canadian ideas have some merit. Um, I did remind him that he was the maligner, but, uh, <laughs> but, but no, it was, it, was, it, was, it was typical of, you know, I think throughout the process while we were, we were firm in terms of where we wanted to end up. We were flexible in terms of how we got there. And as I say, I think you know, the team that we had together, not just, not just I mean, our public service was extraordinary, you know, Steve Rahul and his team, but also you know, the input from stakeholders, the input from the provinces. I mean, it, was, it, was, it really was a Team Canada approach, which, which stood us in really good stead because we were able to, I think, get where we wanted to go to, but sometimes get there in a bit of a circuitous route. Quick follow-up follow up on, on, uh, on auto. Uh, obviously, the GM announcement has it affected five locations, four of the US, one in Canada, right. not welcome news. But I, I take it one would see this as not much to do with recent developments on the trade side and more to do with company putting, its, putting a stake down in terms of how it wants to develop for the future. Yeah, I think that's right. And I mean, I think whether, whether whatever industry you're looking at, there is, um, you know, there's, there's um, you know, disruptive change going on all over the place. And, and we are going to have to find a way to cope with that. The, on, the only relation to the agreement or the, or the negotiations that I would make is that, you know, we started out uh, in the negotiations with the objective to grow trade in North America and to make North America a more competitive jurisdiction in a globally competitive world. And there were some people at the negotiating table that did not have that same view. Uh, they were talking about how you slice up an existing pie as opposed to how you grow that pie. And I think that, that, that was a challenge throughout. And if, if you don't you don't approach trade um, from the point of view of trying to make the whole region more competitive, then you end up in a situation where you're not as competitive as you need to be, and I think we've got to keep that in mind. So, Ambassador, a moment ago I called you very courageous, and with that in mind, I'll ask you one of the questions from Slido. Quote, do Republican politicians say the same things about POTUS in private as they do in public? And has it changed in the last two years? Uh, I'll take the fifth on that one. <laughs> uh, you well, know, I think, I think, 
I think it's it's interesting to uh, it's been it's been an interesting thing to hear from some Republicans about their views, uh, but I'll take the fifth. But, and I don't blame you. You have to be able to get back to the United States to continue doing your job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you uh, know, this this business about free movement of people and everything may stop if I don't. Let, let, let me ask you this question. A lot of folks look at what's happening over the last couple, I mean, first of all, it's my own view, we shouldn't be surprised at much of what's happened. Donald Trump, President Trump has never been elected to any office. He's never acted in any diplomatic sort of uh, role in his entire life. He's been a business person, he's been a negotiator, so his style is, is what it is, uh, it seems to me. Uh, but the question that I would ask you is, is are we seeing a fundamental shift in, historic shift in the Canada-US relationship or are we seeing the manifestation of the Trump style of the presidency? Um, you know, I, I, I mean, uh, clearly, I mean, what, what, we, what we say about this administration is that it's unconventional and I'll leave it at that. Um, having said that, there are trends in the United States that produced an unconventional administration, and that is, um, you know, a number of people feeling left behind, uh, both economically and and as if they nobody paid attention to them, nobody cared about them, and so that that produced both President Trump, but it's also produced, you know. Bernie Sanders, it's produced, I mean, I, I, I have said to people, you know, be careful about what you wish for in terms of, you know, Democrats, because some of them make Bernie Sanders look like a capitalist. I mean, it, there, are, there are, you know, so, and particularly on a trade issue. Now, they seem to be much more, you know, favorably inclined towards Canada and everything else, but, but the reality is what we've got is we've got isolationism and protectionism which has been a strain in, in US politics for a long, long time, emerging. And I think we've gotta pay attention to it. We cannot think that, you know, signing this agreement, and even if it's approved, you know, rapidly through Congress, um, means that we should just go, okay, we, we're gonna go back to sleep again. So let's, so let's take that, that uh, last comment of yours and, and uh note that the government of Canada has very quickly post the signing of the resolution of this, this negotiation, pivoted back to talking about the importance of trade relationships elsewhere in the world, <clears throat> but notably China. So there is obviously a clause there which causes, will cause Canada, obligates Canada to take any proposed comprehensive trade agreement with China and, and run it by its, its partners, Mexico and the United States. Should we read from that there will be no comprehensive attempt at a trade arrangement? Perhaps we're now looking at sectoral approach instead? You know, I think um, if, if we thought that we were going to end up with a comprehensive free trade agreement with China without having a conversation with the United States of America, we were not thinking you know it through um, it is again one of the things where there is bipartisan support within the United States which is the concern about China um, and it isn't you know there there are good things about the China relationship and not so good things I mean from an agricultural point of view they want to export more lots of uh, you know products that are made in China that come into the that that give U.S. consumers a, a, a good deal, but there are things like you know intellectual property and some of the cybersecurity issues and everything else that that you know the United States is worried about and we're worried about too. And so um, I think that uh, the we need to be we're going to have to be open about what we're doing with China, and we expect them to be so be open about it too. Um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't opportunities in China. There clearly are, and we have taken advantage of some of them. And I think the other thing that we have to realize is that we are now the only uh, G7 country which has a free trade agreement with all of the others, uh, the only one. 
And so uh, we will be able to diversify our trade. We've got the- 1.5 billion. Yeah, we've got the CPTPP, we've got, we've got uh, uh, the uh, CETA agreement, and we've got NAFTA. And, and so, so the question really becomes, we, we need to help our businesses, particularly those that aren't used to uh, trading internationally, to, to find a way to do that. We're still going to be reliant on the United States for the vast majority of our trade for a long time to come. Well, speaking of the, of the uh, Canada-China issue, there was a question from Slido a moment ago. I don't see it now, but I'll see if I can summarize it. It effectively was asking Ambassador about the Five Eyes partnership, the uh, Huawei uh, position with each of those partners, um, and the fact that Canada remains, well, it says right here, with Canada seeming to be the last of the Five Eyes to ban Huawei from the 5G system, how do you see the U.S. reacting if we continue to rag the puck? That's the question. Yeah, I think I, 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 I take exception to ragging the puck. Uh, the reality is, is that we are in uh, continuous discussions with the Americans and our other Five Eyes partners about um, the measures that we have taken and are taking to ensure the security of our systems. Um, and I think they are satisfied with our approach at the present moment. I mean, obviously, when you're dealing with technology, um, the question is, you know, you've got it under control at the present moment, but what about the future? And I think that's something that we will continue to be discussing with them. I mean, some people have made certain decisions um, you know, to ban certain products. But the reality is I think we are, as I say, in constant touch with our Five Eyes partners. And, um, you know, so far, I think they think that we are taking the measures that are necessary to protect our systems. Let me ask you a final question. Um, you've, you've had a storied career, a very successful career in the private sector, built great companies and, and uh, moved on from those experiences. You've had great uh, career as well in the public sector. You've been involved in election campaigns. You've run election campaigns. You worked, I said earlier, it was EA to Don Jameson way back. So you've, 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 you've had a whole raft of public and private experiences coming into this job. Uh, I know they both have served you well, but which has been most important to you in trying to deal with the realities of the United States government as it's constituted today? You know, that's, that, that's a difficult one. Um, that's why I saved it for last. Yeah. I mean, it, it, the, the truth of the matter is, is that I've picked up um, little pieces along the way that have helped overall. And no question that, you know, working uh, for Don Jameson and having the opportunity, both industry, trade, and commerce, and foreign affairs at a very young age, um, to travel around the world. Uh, I was in 55 different countries, uh, you know, by the time I was 25 years old or something like that. So yeah, that was a wonderful experience. The private sector, um, you know, there are two lessons. I remember when I was very young and we were starting to ne negotiate, looking at doing acquisitions and everything else. And, and this one wise person said to me, um, when you're trying to do a deal, don't think about, don't focus in on what your bottom line is. Because if you do, you'll get there right away. You need to focus in on what theirs is, because then you can hold back on yours. And, and it was really interesting, and it was really helpful in terms of this negotiation in particular. Um, and, and I think the other, the other part of it is I learned both in politics and in business that um, team is a real thing, um, and that each of us has strengths and weaknesses, and, and the only way you can make one and one add up to three is, is by working together. And I think that um, I've, always, I've always felt that, um, I've hoped I've understood what I don't do very well and found people to work with who supplement that, and certainly this, this experience uh, was terrific in that regard. I mean, Minister Freeland, Katie Telford, Gerald, I mean, the, you know, and, and the public service, we really did work as a team, 
And I think it, it made a huge difference because we had our disagreements. There's no question about that. But we ironed them out, found a way to, to go forward, and then we stuck together in it. And again, as I say, the, the whole Team Canada thing really made a difference too. And when you're up against somebody who's bigger and stronger, and you, you can't win unless you do that. So it was, it was terrific. Ambassador, let me say on behalf, I think of, I'm sure, everybody in this room and certainly people right across this country, you've been the point man on a to put it gently and mildly, a very difficult and challenging and unorthodox negotiation. I think, and I think I can speak for uh, certainly the members of the Canadian business community who are holding our breaths, uh, but I think Canadians generally. I think that, that the result, you can always find fault, you can always hold out for some other objective that ought to have been attained, but in the real world, you gotta make choices. I think the result is, is fantastic for Canada, I think we needed this stability going forward. I think it's the point, man, you've done a fantastic job for the country, and we thank you for your service. Thanks, Thanks Brian. Gentlemen, thank you.